speaker is Gary Rufkin. And uh, Gary's been doing some phenomenal work in genetics of NGLI1 deficiency. Uh, he's presently the, in the Department of Molecular Genetics at Massachusetts General Hospital and at Harvard Medical School. And he's been using C. elegans as a genetic model to identify all the genes that might impact the deficiency of NGLI1. Thank you, Gary. Seems like it's okay. Great, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm gonna tell you about how uh, we meandered into the NGLI1 pathway uh, and uh, why that's good news. Uh, not just that we happen to meander in, but that biology in general is a rather finite game. And I'll explain what I mean by that as I go along. Uh, I want to stress that uh, this work is all by one person, Nick Lerbach, who's a postdoc in the lab, who's a real superstar, uh, and so I am but his spokesman. So every, every bit of the, the work and 99.9% .9 of the thought uh, is his. I will take credit for 0.1%. <laughs> so um, we were working on this not because we wanted to work on anglycosylation at all. Uh, we were interested in the most conserved proteins uh, in the proteome of organisms, including all the way to bacteria, and how those might be attacked uh, in the warfare that exists between bacteria and animals and bacteria and bacteria. So we were working on it in a kind of an immunology sense and a toxicology sense, uh, and not really thinking about the proteasome in any detail. Now the proteasome is an organelle in a cell that takes proteins in a cell and uh, sort of runs them. It's sort of the garbage disposal. And, and in one sense, it's, you know, it's, as a destructive element, it's, it seems less mysterious than sort of making proteins like the ribosome or something like that. But a cell needs to have you know, input and output just like we need it in our homes. And so the proteasome is a very conserved element of that. And it, ha it has this kind of ring structure made up of, of hexamers of proteins, and it grabs another protein and, and, and sort of grinds it up into peptides, into small fragments. And then this is showing how conserved it is. So these letters each correspond to one of the 20 amino acids that every protein is made out of. And so, you know, that's a cysteine, that's a threonine, that's a lysine, and you can read down the protein sequence. And if you compare uh, a protein from our little animal, the worm, <laughs> and line it up and ask who does it match out of all the billions and billions of protein sequences that are now in genome databases, you can see, for example, that this, you know, VTYSDVGG is in a worm and it's also in an archaea, right? Archaea is even more divergent uh, than a bacteria from us. It's a very, very divergent organism, sort of the base of the tree of life. So these proteasome components are, are some of the most conserved uh, proteins in all of biology. Uh, and we were working on it for that reason. And so all these organisms have it. This is us, animals, at this little uh, twig of the tree of life. This is about four billion years ago when uh, life evolved on Earth. And so, you know, the there's a lot of different bacteria, a lot of different archaea. Most of the diversity out there in the world is, is uh, tiny little microbes. And, you know, our next closest neighbor are fungi and then plants. And so all us animals are pretty much the same. So this is the little worm we work on. It's a nematode. So this is expanding this tiny little twig of the tree of life. Right? So we, we're so proud of ourselves as humans, but, uh, uh, you know, we ain't nothing. We're, we're just this, you know, we got a little clade here, we got starfish here, we got, you know, lots of different kind of worth earthworms here, nematodes here. So why, if everything's the same, why work on any one thing? And the reason is some particular organisms are cute. This doesn't show up very well, but this is sh these are moving. Uh, so these little worms grow on plates, and they eat E. coli, and so you can use the tools of bacteriology. So 
So the first people to ever work on C. elegans as a genetic system were E. coli geneticists in the early 60s. And so they came into it saying, oh, wow, we can grow these on Petri dishes, on auger, just like we do bacteria. I'm very comfortable with this. <laughs> right? And so they started working on this organism. It's about a millimeter long. So I can no longer see it with my naked eye, uh, but my daughter can. Uh, and, and they crawl on the plates. They have a, a 959 cells. Just the fact that you can name every cell, and every cell has a name. Uh, there are people who specialize in the ADF neuron versus the ADL neuron, that sort of thing. So er every cell has a name. It was the first genome sequence to be done of an animal. It was sort of the test case because its genome is about a 30th the size of our genome because we humans are filled with junk, as are most animals. These guys are the race cars of genomics. They don't have a lot of junk. They've been protecting their genomes for a billion years or so. And so they're just pure genes, right? You don't, and so genome sequence was cheap initially. And these days in deep sequencing genetics, genome sequences can be done very cheaply. And so we do um, 500 genome sequences a year in my lab now. And I'm not a big industrial lab. I have a dozen people. We, you know, we're a small scale lab, but genomics has evolved to the point where now you, you can do a genome sequence on a worm you happen to pick out. So these guys are really the Maserati of genetics. And I hate to break it to you, but humans are kind of the Ford Pinto of human <laughs> genetics. Uh, the, you know, because you just, you can't do crosses and, and we're all mixed up, but you know, but you'll see how f we, we can just do experiments really cheaply and get new data quickly. It's a, there's about 3,000 of us that work on this little worm. So it's a large community. We, when we go and have our conventions, there'll be signs in restaurants that say, welcome worm biologists. It's really hilarious. So we were working on this. Nick was working on it, uh, trying to figure out how a proteasome knows when it's being attacked by a drug from a, from a, 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 a microbe. And so he built some reporter genes to proteasome subunits. So this is one of the proteins or genes that encodes one of the subunits of a proteasome and he fuses it to a green fluorescent protein that comes out of a jellyfish. And that allows you to be able to score whether that gene has been switched on or off by whether the worm glows green or not. So you can put that fusion gene that he uh, uh, constructed in the lab into a worm and it's not on if the worm is growing happily, but if you stress it, by attacking its proteasome, and here we do it by doing RNAi, which is a mechanism of, of feeding them double-stranded RNA that will attack one of their 20,000 genes. And so we're attacking the proteasome, not the same gene, but a related gene. Now it turns on that GFP fusion. So then he could ask the question, if I take a, a wild-type worm and I throw a mutagen at it, it's just an alkylating agent, a chemical that causes mutations. He could have used gamma rays. He could have used any of a number of UV light will do it too. And he asked, and he just looked manually for green worms. So he's not giving them drugs. He's not giving them RNAi. He's mutagenizing their genome, asking the worm to hallucinate an attack on its proteasome. So based on its own mutation, now you can tell I went to Berkeley in the 60s because I used the term hallucinate. It's pretty, uh, you know, you, for you young people, uh, that's... <laughs> so Nick then took his green worms. Now let, let me put this in perspective. It used to be if you did a genetic screen like that and you got a mutant out, it was like a five-year process of deferred gratification of bookkeeping, it was horrible, right? Excel, before Excel, you'd have like graph papers and the bookkeeping is terrible. And it took five years to figure out what the gene was. Nick picked all his green worms, made DNA from them, did some fancy gen, you know, DNA work to put linkers on the end, rent, gave it to the deep sequencing service facility, and three weeks later we get back the genome sequences of all his mutants, 100 mutants. 
And every mutant that he's isolated has been through a mutagenesis. And so it has about 300 lesions in its genome. So it has 300 different mutations all over its genome. But he could see that he had multiple hits of the same gene in each of his, in 20 of his mutants, right? So he could, he would get a, a mutation. This is a, a RPN10 mutation. So that's in this ring. This is a mutation here. This is a mutation here. So he had mutations in all these um, subunits of the proteasome that he sort of expected to see. This was a proof of principle. And then a whole bunch of new things that he didn't expect to see. Now this, uh, we knew from, from other work from, from Sunil Radhakrishnan that there's a transcriptional response in mammalian cells that's uh, mediated uh, by a, a, a transcription factor called NRF1, and we had a homologue of that in the worm. So Nick could uh, show that if he knocked down that skin one homologue, he would now fail to get that green response. So this is showing that there was an intersection now with what was just emerging from the mammalian work. And in fact, when he had a point mutation in a proteasome subunit, these guys were perfectly viable. But if he also knocked down skin one by using RNAi to knock it down, it was now dead. So the reason these point mutant animals are alive is that they realize there's some problem with their proteasome. It's a homeostatic mechanism. It's physiology. They turn on this skin one transcription factor, but if you blunt the skin one by turning it off, which is fine in a wild type, but if they have this kind of proteasome stress, it's lethal. So now he could, he could take a mutant and do the opposite. So now he starts with a mutant that's perceiving its proteasome defect so it's green. And now you just play the game backwards. Instead of looking for green worms as he did in his first screen, now he can look for ungreen worms. And he, it's, it's, you know, this is heaven to a geneticist, right? You do a, do a screen, pick more mutants. So he picked uh, a couple hundred mutants that were non-green did the genome sequence of those, and he got uh, these genes, DDI1, PNG1, et cetera. The, the, this is sort of what they look like. The starting strain is green. If they carry this lesion as well, they fail to turn on the green. So this is the kind of thing that I live for, right, which is genetics throws me in the deep end of multiple swimming pools. So Nick comes in and he goes, hey, look at this. You know, I did the screen for ungreen worms and I got seven alleles of one gene. A mutation here, L to F, a mutation here, a C to S. When you get seven alleles, this is, you know, this is the best, right? You just, this is a good day. But, and what's really fun about it is you say, well, what the hell's DDI1, right? We don't know, you know, you, there's 20,000 genes. I can't know everything about every gene. So you get onto PubMed, which is a database of all the science available, and you punch in DDI1, and you'll find that there's 12 papers. That's good, right? I, if it's 100 papers, it's horrible, right? How am I going to read all 100? Uh, 12 I can read. And so it turned out it was a, a gene that was stood for DNA damage inducible in yeast. Somebody had given a yeast. DNA damage, that's a very sophisticated field. DNA damage is, is not, it's very highly evolved field. Uh, but this is a minor little player in that field. So it's perfect, right? Somebody that's a little bit known, we're now backing into it, that'll be fun. What the hell's PNG1? What's NGLI1? We didn't know. We weren't, well, I didn't know about any of this community. So we start reading the NGLI1 literature and realizes, well, okay, maybe NGLI1 is coupled to proteasomal degradation. And it didn't seem like that's what the field was focused on, although I, I think that the Deshaies lab was definitely pushing the field in that direction. And, and, uh, and so this is a kind of a, a, the wonderful thing about science is that when you're on the right track, it's usually kind of obvious when you are, because usually what you're studying synergizes really nicely with what somebody else is studying. You might not know each other, but the sum of the two really adds up to something much bigger than what you expected. And again, Nick got 
two different mutations in this NGLI1 saying that DDI and, and, and it's called PNG1 in the, in the worm, but it's really the NGLI1 homologue. Oops, one more thing. And then these other genes in the pathway, again, multiple alleles. So when you get more than one allele, you've queried the whole genome and, and it's saying, even though you've done it multiple, multiple times, it keeps coming up with the same target. Seven times we got DDI1, twice we got PNG1, three times we got cell one. So it's saying these are the major players and these are known to be involved in endoplasmic reticulum associated degradation, basically how cells know when their secretor secretory apparatus, how they send proteins out into the world. It's all about cellular communication. That's a real tax on the system. And they have to be able to know when, it's, when there's proteins that are sort of aggregating in the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is part of the process of that feedback mechanism. This is what the endoplasmic reticulum looks like. So that's the nucleus of a cell. It surrounds that nucleus, and so when, when transcripts come out of the nucleus and are destined to make secreted proteins, it's a rather big organelle inside of a cell. So this is, again, the homology. This is taking a query uh, that is the C. elegans NGLI1. So the top line here is C. elegans, and the bottom line here is the human. And when I'm, what I'm bolding here are the mutations that have been found in the human patients, right? So some of your kids uh, have these mutations. So that's a, a glutamate that's changed, the bold, that's an arginine that's changed. And you can see that those uh, changes are conserved to the worm, so that we're studying a true ortholog. That, that means it's not just like a cousin of the NGLI1, but the common ancestor of all animals had this NGLI1 disease about a, uh, sorry, not disease, gene. And, the, and, it, and uh, we've, all animals have inherited it from that common ancestor. It was evolved to the point that this couldn't change over the last billion years. And so if it does change, that's uh, sort of why it's, it's deleterious. Uh, our mutations are uh, here in a glycine. It's not in a conserved glycine, uh, but it's a glycine to arginine change or a stop codon. And we know that the null mutation in PNG1 um, uh, is viable and has very, exactly the same phenotype. So here's the mutations that uh, Nick pulled out. And, um, uh, and there are actually two other, and this actually came out of, before we were even involved, the Colavita lab, another worm lab, we're doing screens for neurons and how neurons will branch or not branch. And they got a mutation that changed branching of neurons, which is much more allied with the, the uh, neural defects that many of the clinicians have noted and that the fly genetics is also uh, found. So the, there's sort of two sides to NGLI1. And I don't think, we, our work hasn't added anything to the synaptic side and we haven't engaged that at all yet. Uh, our work is, is saying, no, it's all about the proteasome in, in many other types of cells. Uh, but we, uh, it's a goal for us, especially based on this meeting and hearing about it, to, to try to circle back to what's going on at the synapse uh, and what's going on with neuronal ax axon finding, especially given the neurological symptoms of, of the children. So one of the things that uh, Nick noticed is, okay, he has a PNG1 allele, so it should fail in this signaling pathway to the skin one protein. Uh, and so he uh, challenged them uh, with a proteasome inhibitor. So this is a drug that's actually used in the clinic to inhibit the proteasome. It's the mainline treatment uh, for multiple myeloma, which is a a disease of too much protein secretion, and so it's very sensitive to proteasome inhibition. And so a wild-type animal, for example, would be resistant to this much bortezomib, but his PNG1 mutant was really sensitive to that. And so you can quantitate that. So this is doing a, a, a dilution series where you take bortezomib and keep diluting it twofold from right to left. 
and you can see that what you get a, a rest of a wild type animal at about one microgram per mil, uh, but a skin one mutant or a PNG one mutant is arresting at, at sort of a hundred fold uh, less bortezomib, so it's really sensitive to bortezomib. Okay, let me, let me move forward. I'm going to skip this because I want to get to this part. So what about going to uh, suppressors of the bortezomib sensitivity? This is the idea of, is there a way to make an NGLI1 mutant more healthy in a worm. And the first thing we have to do is make them unhealthy. And so we can treat them with bortezomib. So we have an NGLI1 mutant. It's very unhealthy when you stress its proteasome. And now we ask genetically for who will come out and survive that kind of an insult. And you can't see my graphic that I'm so proud of. See, I made that arrow rotate. So. Uh, <laughs> I did that. That's the 0.1% that I add to this project. So what Nick has taken a picture of here, and it doesn't show up very clearly, but all the animals that are NGLI1 uh, that don't have a, a rescuing mutation are arrested in this amount of bortezomib. And this one animal is much healthier than all the rest. And Nick could pick it out, grow it up, test it again. And yes, yep, it suppressed NGLI1. And so, he did the genome sequence, so it was just to tell you how he did it. So he pulls out 97 mutants out of 100,000. You know, he's looking at hundreds of thousands of worms, right? So again, this is why it's the Maserati. You can't look at 100,000 patients unless you have budgets of a billion dollars, right? 100,000 worms, we, we could, you know, our budget's $100,000, right? So it's nothing. So he pulls out the suppressors, he, 22 of them he sent to get the genome sequenced a couple weeks later. He gets mutations back, and again, this, this is happiness to a geneticist. You know, multiple alleles, six alleles of the same gene, right? Transaldolase, all right? That is a, a gene involved in metabolism. This is the kind of stuff I hate, right? You know, we had to learn metabolism in, in, in college, and there were exams, and. You had to draw molecular pathways, and you got the carbons wrong, and the oxygens wrong, and there were nitrogens in there. It was horrible. That, that's why I went into genetics. <laughs> you don't have to know that stuff. Well, now I do. So uh, I'll try to explain why. So that, that, this is good news for drugs, right? So because an enzyme is something that drug developers like. It has an active site. It, recognizes small molecules, because that's what it does. It, I'll tell you what it does in a second. Uh, the next gene, four alleles. Again, two-thirds as much happiness as this, right? We get four different alleles. This is involved in, in transporting nucleosides, this, the precursors to DNA replication and RNA, that sort of thing. So maybe this is making nucleotides, and this is transporting them. We don't know. but it, when you get four alleles, it says these are the central players. This is a, a kinase involved in signal transduction, the sort of thing we think. We think of this as a signaling pathway between the proteasome and the nucleus. Uh, and then this is a very worm-specific protein that's a very highly glycosylated protein that might be competing uh, with the glycosylation of the, of the uh, uh, skin one, NRF1. So here's the transaldolase. Again, this is the metabolism, taking glucose. It's, it's called the pentose phosphate pathway. Uh, and, and the transaldolase acts at this step, making this precursor that then goes to nucleotide synthesis. Uh, these these uh, are, are partial cures to the defects in PNG1. I, you know, this is not a perfect cure. So here's how sensitive it is to bortezomib. These suppressors don't bring it all the way back to here, which would call it a real cure, but it's a therapeutic for what we're doing to the worm. Uh, so th this is a hopeful sign, I would say, um, in terms of an approach. But I, I want to be clear on, you know, I'm a worm geneticist. I'm doing worm genetics, whether this will apply to a human is uh, way beyond my ability to predict. 
So it just says that there is a genetic approach to finding something that will make NGLY1 better in a worm. And these are conserved genes. Maybe it'll work in a human, but it's way out there. So don't, don't, I'm not, I don't want to oversell what we're, we're doing yet. So one, one of the worries, oops, there we go, sorry. <coughs> one of the worries about our suppressors is maybe it's just drug resistance. Remember, we're treating the animal with a drug and maybe we're just making them, you know, humans or animals are really good at detoxifying drugs. We've been, drugs are not just the invention of the pharmaceutical industry, right? Drugs are what microbes have been producing for three billion years, and we came onto the scene a billion years ago. So uh, we've been under attack and we made it. And the reason we made it is we're really good at drug detoxification and pumping it out. So we were sort of worried, well, these mutants, maybe they're just really good at drug detoxification. But what Nick noticed was that in his PNG1 mutants, they have this sort of nondescript bursting from their abdomen. And it's, we don't understand anything about it, but it has nothing to do with drugs. It's sort of something about lack of glycosylation or lack of deglycosylation makes them put together their cuticle badly. But his suppressors could suppress that. And so the fact that his suppressors could suppress that says, no, it's not just drug detoxification. They're actually suppressing another of the phenotypes. So we're sort of hopeful that we're on the right track uh, of, of how that might work. So we want to see now whether it changes the transcription of the proteasome genes. Does it depend on skin one? We don't know yet. Uh, and then the, the, uh, I think the view of using uh, the nucleotide transporters or the uh, transaldolase for drug screens seems like a reasonable approach and uh, we're very open to people in the, in the drug screening industry doing that and looking at it. Okay, so let me just finish. It's Nick, I want to stress. Uh, uh, the Grace Foundation has been uh, funding this since uh, they found us, which was great and uh, NIH has also been funding it. Thanks so much. Fascinating, as always. So the suppressor that you picked up, that can also suppress the defect of the SKN1. Do you know? Okay. And the NOF1, SKN1. Uh, no, I don't think they do yet. No, oh. they, I don't think they do. You mean you don't know yeah. yet? Okay. I think he's looked at that. Oh, okay. You're trying to compress, uh, combine the other suppressors? Yeah, make double mutants with the suppressors? Definitely. Yeah, ask if they're more additive. Good idea. Have you looked at protein synthesis? No. The suppressors? Would you expect that reduced protein synthesis would, would affect the aging, and it could also affect the oh, garbage see. can? Yeah, they, they grow at a normal rate. So we, we, usually when you slow down protein synthesis, everything really, you know, it's like the clock ticks more slowly. And they're growing at a normal rate. They're pretty so, healthy. This, so what's your wildest guess on what these nucleosides are doing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not there yet. I'm still confused. Yeah. So you said it's a nucleoside transporter. Transport from where to where? Yeah, we don't know. Maybe the gut to the rest of the animal. We don't know yet. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. So just as an FYI, there is a human disease with TALDO deficiency. Those patients are sicker than dirt. I think most of them are dead and they have severe, severe liver disease. Hmm. So it's interesting that it would rescue the Engli-1 phenotype in your worms. Mm. But you might be able to collaborate with some of the physicians and scientists that have looked at yes. the polyol disorders as a group, which is where they fall in human disease, and see if you can work together yeah. on that. And yeah, we have null alleles, right? So they're not special alleles. Mm -hmm. Again, that's the distance from a worm to a human that's you know cause for uh, not jumping up and down, but uh, being Careful. Okay. So, 
So the next speaker is uh, Tadashi Suzuki, and he. Oh, we're break. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes. Make sure, say ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs>